Welcome, everybody, to Second Floor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Kenny Buller, and I'm joined by Kurt and Hal, who I believe are two you know, staples in our jiu-jitsu community in Edmonton, Alberta here. Um, I personally trained with Hal when I was literally 14 years old. I've known him in the jiu-jitsu and martial arts community now for over a decade, and I've been hearing personally a lot of buzz on uh, our gentleman sitting right in front of us, Kurt, who happens to be a public school teacher yep. and as well has blended um, his teachings and passion for jujitsu to be able to um, allow for jujitsu to be um, pretty much uh, an actual sport involved in public schools in our city. This is something that personally I thought um, should be mandatory ever since I got into it as a kid. And I remember just the amount of pullback that idea would get by so many instructors, mm -hmm. but we're looking at the man that did it. And uh, I'm excited for everyone to, you know, know their personal stories, have us chat and learn more about the benefits of jujitsu. Um, as you know, you've been listening to our podcast for a while. This is my passion. This is something that I do for a living. And uh, I wanna bring more and more uh, jujitsu quote unquote influencers for people to learn not only from me, but from their perspective on the importance of how jujitsu can change your life. So welcome, gentlemen. It's, it's an honor to have you both here. Right on. Thanks for having us. I, uh, I want to start off with uh, both of you just sharing, you know, how jujitsu has changed your life and why you continue to train at it, especially for both of you and your black belts. You've done it for so many years and, uh, you know, just you're still so heavily involved. And whoever wants to go first. Uh, so I was a hockey player growing up because uh, I live in Edmonton. So obviously that's what you do. So aspirations of playing in the NHL and being a small player during the, that era of hockey, like big guys were kind of like, well, you got to be big. And I'm not big. So uh, so I did play all the way through and I, I ended up playing NCAA hockey and, and had school paid for. But then I ran into concussion issues. Uh, so we basically I was forced to medically retire. So when you medically retire and you've you've done one sport your entire life there's a little bit of a, like an identity crisis for me it's like well what am i gonna do uh and i had always enjoyed martial arts movies right so started kind of looking around the city and at that time what were we at like 2002 i think there was two schools doing jujitsu cal cardinal and then arashido with mike yaklik had just started uh so i joined so i joined arashido and started training and then from that point forward Given that jujitsu is what it is, uh, there's almost like no threat of concussions. Uh, obviously, I shy away a little bit from judo and from so the big wrestling throws to make sure that I don't get slammed. Uh, but pulling guard kind of <laughs> alleviates that problem. Uh, it's not as glorious as the the big judo throws, but it keeps me safe. Uh, and then it just it was one of those things where if you like you pour yourself into it, jujitsu gives you everything back. So the more effort you put in, the more time you spend researching and training, like that skill shows up. And I just found that jujitsu was so real, right? Like you could go a thousand percent with your buddy. And at the end, it was like, it, it's like fight, but it's not. It's not like when we put gloves on and spar because I, I did kickboxing, but I could never spar because I couldn't take that chance of just getting clipped. Uh, so jujitsu has given me that outlet to continue to pursue a sport at the same level that I, I pursued hockey at. Uh, and then, of course, be safe. And then that's transitioned into like at my actual career now. Uh, so it's been it's been a, quite the journey. It's nice you found like the, the immediate, you could say, um, replacement, because that's not easy, right? Like there's a lot of athletes that get um, depressed from not being able to go back. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, that, and that was a worry, especially with concussions, because it eliminated so many other things that I could do. Uh, but it was, yeah, jujitsu saved me because otherwise I would have ended up like, I don't know, maybe being a runner or something. And of course, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that makes you hurts. sweat buckets. Yes, it's <laughs> terrible. Uh, and it hurts my knees and stuff. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was a good find. And I hit like it was just at the right time in Edmonton, because if I would have been six months earlier, like I, I might not have found it because jiu-jitsu just wasn't like it hadn't been established yet i wouldn't even be surprised if we're at 20 jiu-jitsu programs that are offered in edmonton now when you compare it to two over 20 years ago oh yeah it's growing and it's 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 growing in leaps and bounds mm -hmm. especially in the last 
eight or ten years, I think. It's really jumped, and I think it's going to continue to grow. I, I think there's a huge growth. And uh, my friend Steve Bartley, who, who owns Elite, he, he talks about, uh, you know, there, there's some, there's a lot of competition between certain gyms, but you only need to control one or two percent of the soccer and hockey people to, to flourish in martial arts, right? And that, and that comes from Steve, who's been in the business for years and years, right? Yeah. Really good guy. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, you know, like, I, I never played high level hockey. But I played hockey for 55 straight seasons, right? Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's a lot of hockey. I, I, I loved hockey. And then for me, I, I, um, you know, second marriage, my wife, are, and Don, let's, let's go to the community center and, and try this kickboxing program. So I'm down there and Gasper Bonomo is running it, right? And I think we all know Gasper. Yep. And he's there, okay, you've had gloves on before. And I go, yeah, a couple of times. So, you know, I, I did that for a while. And then I ended up downtown at Legends and, 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 uh, Train, training, um, holding pads for all you young guys and, and Beaumont, McGilvery, all those guys were down there and I liked the energy and the vibe of the gym, right? It was, you know, so this is kind of cool and all these young guys, try this jiu-jitsu thing. They were after me. I said, I can't do that. I'm too old. And I'll never forget. I went on the mat and uh, with Beaumont, I think the first time, broke my toe, taped it up, kept going and then... Of course that happens with Beaumont. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like of all people. And then... And then uh, it wasn't his fault. I, ca I caught my toe in the mat, right? And then, and then uh, maybe I think the third, the third or fourth time I tried it, I rolled with Rodrigo, right? And uh, like I'm on his feet, elevate it, and he's talking to me about three minutes, just talk, turning me in a circle, talking to me about why. I, I said I got to learn this. It's crazy, and I and I couldn't wrap my head around like tiny people. You know, Kurt's not my size, but could control me and do what they want, and I'm. I've always been a big, strong guy, right? I'm still pretty strong. I'm old, but I'm still pretty strong, right? And to this day, I, I marvel at how people can can manipulate the angles, the understanding of what I'm doing to control me. And I'm trying to do the same. And it's just, a, a, if you live to be a thousand, you'll never figure it out. It's such a puzzle. And and it's such a, an escape from the world. Mm -hmm. I, I, I fell in love with it. I, I started at... You know, just after my 50th birthday is the first time I ever tried it. And uh, it's for everybody. It's for me. Just shows it's never too late, right? It's never too late. No. And, and you know, we have people coming to our gym that, you know, they're 40 and they say, they think they're old. I go, no, no. I was talking to a girl last week. I'm 44. I said, you know what? I never never tried this till I was 50. And you can do it. And, and you can't, you know, at my age, I can't roll hard every day with young young professional athletes. I can't do that because I, I want to do this till I'm 63. Oh, yeah, I'm already there. I want to do this till I'm 80, 90. Yeah. But I have to be smart with my training and my rolling and pick my partners. And, and we have some, you know, big, strong guys in our gym. I mean, frankly, they could maul me and hurt me. But I, I talk to them and we go smooth. And that's how it has to be, right? Because I'm, I'm in love with it. And I, I have a pretty good understanding of, of some of it. Sure, I'm a black belt. But that doesn't make me any better than anybody else. I'm a black belt. I've just been at it for enough, and I've done some things, but I have enough of an understanding I can give back, and that for me, that's one of the big the big things. I really enjoy seeing a, a kid. You know, you probably see it more in your program because you have a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Or you're walking in, in the class and do that different, and the, and the light goes on for them. How did you? Know that? I've seen that a hundred times. That works that different, yeah. and 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 that could be a child, an adult, man, woman. It doesn't matter. The light goes on, and and I. I kind of get a rush out of that. Oh, look at you learn, right? I'm helping you get better. And, and you know, I've, I enjoy the coaching. I love the social environment. It's a great sport. And, and, you know, we were talking earlier. Is it for everybody? Maybe, maybe not, right? Hmm. Well, I mean, like, let, let's talk about the, the fact of who it's for, right? Because those light bulb moments I feel like you need as a human. There's, I find moments of boredom that come into play at any point in someone's life. Like I used to say this phrase as a kid, I'm bored. And then my parents took that risk of let's put him in martial arts. Like, yeah. you know, this, this is something that it takes people supposedly a decade to get the hang of. Okay, you know, our son will be at a point where he's an adult by then. You get to learn discipline, but it's at the risk of him learning how to punch and kick people. He's a little rowdy, but he needs discipline. Let's give him that. And, and I find like, to your point, how like if anyone's listening to this, whether it's them or their kids, and you're bored, like you've just been doing something um, for, let's just say, a certain amount of time where 
you're no longer interested in it, then try jujitsu because I'm a big believer in anybody can look at it and respect. I find the patience and dedication it takes to get the hang of it. And I think that's actually one of the biggest things that people get hooked on by it is once they do get past, let's face it, the, the uncomfortable um, nature around being that close to another stranger yep. that's i think one of the first things that people need to kind of like just get over and accept like yeah you're gonna be that close and i understand it's very uncomfortable for some people based off what they've gone through and, and we're gonna get into that but once you get past that going back to Hal's point about it being a puzzle you're you're lost in the sauce in in trying to figure it out right it's too late and i find as instructors now or as you know someone like kurt who teaches kids this is something i'm starting to be aware of is like knowing that there's a way a white belt needs to understand the concepts of jiu-jitsu compared to where you know it at mm -hmm. with your knowledge and i think that's where you kind of need to get over and i'm interested in picking your brain about this kurt Absolutely. where you need to get over like getting them to be to know all the details and it's like you know what if they're just gonna pass guard and at least they lift their knee up in knee shield and they have the underhook and just two super important aspects of it yep. and the rest kind of looks sloppy we'll we'll get that better over time but like how do you look at that when it comes to like someone's new to jujitsu mm -hmm. it's let's just say even a kid at one of your school programs how do you look at the perfection of how they need to understand the material I think it, it, it depends on the student, right? So like stepping back and looking at it from like an academic teacher perspective, the, the kids in my class when I used to, t I taught grade five for like 16 years. Uh, when you take a look at all of the students in your class, they can all be taught the same way, right? And we were all in school. We know the same teachers that stood up and just like wah, wah, wah. And then, or wrote notes on the board and expected that to work blanket for the whole room. Uh, so coming from that, uh, the academic side of it and then applying that to jujitsu, there are some kids that come in, you know, into my program and they've got 10 years of gymnastics experience. Well, those kids can pick up jujitsu like in a heartbeat. Whereas I've, I have other kids that will come in and I'll be like, okay, I need you to move your right foot uh, move it to the left and they're just like you can see them processing it and like you just moved your hip I asked you to move your foot and like get onto your other hip and then they just lay on their side and say, <laughs> yeah. whereas whereas like the kid who's right beside that who's got 10 years of gymnastics experience just did a cartwheel pass because they thought it might work and it did uh, so coming at it from that you have to take in basically you look at a concept that you're going to teach and then you give it to the whole room. And then during drilling, you go to the students that need hands-on experience, where it's like, okay, I'm gonna move your foot to where it needs to go because there's no way that you got it when I showed it the three times and we talked about it, right? Because that's visual and auditory. Some kids, the kinesthetic learners, they need to be moved, they need to like feel it. And it's like, oh, well, do it to me. And then while they're doing it, I'm moving their hand to where they need to be. Okay, when you hip bump, not here, I need to feel it on my hip, roll your foot over, and you get into all those little details while the kids that can see it and do it, they're just drilling it over and over again, right? So we, that does create like a different pace in the room. Uh, so some kids are gonna learn faster than others. But again, going back to jiu-jitsu and going back to not getting bored is everybody in the room is learning at their own pace. They're all learning the same material. They're all understanding it at a different level. And then when we start rolling, you get to see how all of that melds together and then what happens, right? Because some of the kids that take a long time to get stuff, they're also uber aggressive. So then sometimes that aggressiveness trumps the kids who are technical wizards. So then you can talk to them about like, okay, well, when you blasted through his guard, you got through there because you were going at like a thousand miles per hour. Next time, catch the underhook. Let's focus on that one detail. And then you see it in the next roll, high five, and mm. then you move on, right? So in our, in our program, given how much mat time we have, that's kind of the focus is to make sure that each individual student is getting the type of instruction that is best for them. Because we have some kids that are world beaters, and then we have some other kids that won't, won't ever compete. That's a cool thing, man, because you're now making people aware at such a young age 
how they learn. Like, what a great way to learn how you learn through jujitsu. Yeah. And you could really see that right away. Yeah. Like, one that just isn't getting it by watching, but then when they do it with you, it clicks. Yeah. Right? And I think that's important even for, for parents to understand, or if you are young listening to this, that I never knew how I learned, to be very honest, until I finished university. Like, like until I was done, and I started to, like, dissect how the way I went about it was a little unnecessary. I, I read the full textbook. I wrote notes. I spent too much extra time on trying to know everything. When instead, I, I actually would have conversations about this with friends and people that went through college, and, and they would just know what they needed to know. Right, and then however way they they did that, one would read a PowerPoint, one would say things out loud, another person would, you know, just find ways to take out cue cards. Yep. But I mean, I remember how hard it was for me growing up because I try so hard to not get the mark I wanted, right? Yep. But then if you can now tie in a good coach that can tell you how you learn, I think that that can bridge the gap to like finding success in and how you learn and can effectively digest material as a kid. Yeah, and it's not necessarily telling you how to learn it. It's discovering it with you. Like given the years that I have, you can watch a kid and be like, okay, that kid's going to need hands on. So as soon as I show it, I come over and be like, okay, do it to me. Like you can start to recognize that, but that's just years of experience. But going back years and years, like there there were ways that we had to figure that out. Like the one year I had a kid with cerebral palsy in my room uh, in jiu-jitsu, and he had never done it before. Uh, and his mom was like, I'm unsure, I'm unsure, but his brother really wants in the program too, so we're going to put them both in. Uh, and he had been uh, like swimming a lot. It was one of the things that helped with his muscle development, and it was just easier on his body. Uh, so his upper body was just, for his age, was so strong. Uh, it was His legs and his coordination, that was one of the issues. So that year, modifying everything that we did to teach jujitsu to make him like upper body dependent uh, and to, to watch how he would learn and he'd watch the technique that we'd show all of the, like the able-bodied kids. And then we would go over and sit with him and then modify the technique so he could use it basically from like the waist up. Uh, and there were techniques because he was so strong there were techniques that if he got on top of somebody, like in side mount, his Americana was like, oh, it's done. You're, you'll never get out of that. Nice. And like his shoulder pressure from side mount, it's like, we shouldn't have shoulder, showed him this. This is terrible. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it was, uh, so helping kids discover, like you said, how, how they learn. Because if they're watching me and listening to me and then they're not getting it, then we go over and say, well, what's, what's the deal? What's the, oh, I just don't understand it. It's like, well, show me what you know. And then they show it and they've missed they've missed the last like three details so then maybe that's an attention thing and then as a teacher maybe i have to shorten up what i'm doing for instruction like instead of talking for two minutes maybe it needs to be like 90 seconds 60 seconds and then let them go drill it and then bring them back and we teach it right so it's just that constant uh refinement of of what you're doing to ensure that the kids are getting the most out of you it's funny you mentioned that. That was something that uh, Sebastian from Yoga for BJJ even talked about. Is just trimming down how long you're teaching the concept for, yeah. especially the kids. It's like you don't want to lose them. Like after two minutes of talking, yep. they show it as quick as you actually can. Yep. Get them to try it, yep. and then from there you can kind of pick up on like maybe some things that they're they're getting stuck with. Yeah, right. Yeah, we call that. Uh, we call that when anytime we show a new technique, the first round. We just call it like the hacking in the woods round. Yeah. It's like you kind of know where the path is, but not really. So just yeah. do everything you think you saw, and then we're gonna bring you all back. We're gonna show it again, and that's when you see. That's when you see the kids are like, "Oh, I missed that underhook. That's why it wasn't working." I'm that kid that always wishes the instructor can show it just one more time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I you see know? that from one more angle? It's the same with adults. I mean, you can show an adult group of, of you know purple belts, brown belts, mm -hmm. myself black belts and, and, and somebody will demonstrate a technique and you go back and there's just one piece of the puzzle I'm not quite getting and then yep. somebody you know it could be the new white belt or who knows that and then it just the light oh the light went on for me on that one right I mean I, 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 I like your, your method the methodology of, of how you're bringing the kids around but it, it you know where I train we're, 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 it's similar I think and, and I'm not the lead teacher but I, I, I get to help and 
you know, they'll demonstrate, we'll demonstrate a few times and we'll break them into groups. Depending um, on, on belt levels, and I, I, I'm a believer, I like to see the, the senior belts go with the, the, people call them lower belts, I don't like that, but, you know, the white belts, the blue belts, I, th I think it's a good way to pass knowledge and to share knowledge. Yeah, well, and what that does is it ensures that the white belts, blue belts, whoever is learning the technique yeah. is learning the technique properly. And that right. was one of the things, like in my jiu-jitsu journey, starting when I did, uh, my instructor was one stripe, two stripes ahead of me. So we were both white belts at the time. And like we were, you know, we found a couple of VH S tapes yeah, yeah. of like Michael Chen doing the gi chokes and he's wearing like sweatpants and his socks. Like that was like the BJJ fanatics, like the beginning. The DVD it, days. Yeah, the, but not even DVD, it was VHS. And that was the one. <laughs> you had to like basically like get a hold of people in Toronto and then beg them to send out like a pirated stuff. And we were learning on our own. So it's weird when I watch, especially when I watch other black belts teach. Uh, there's a whole bunch of foundational stuff that I'll just be sitting there and sometimes I'm like the demo guy and he'll be talking through whoever it is and, and I'll just be in my head being like, I didn't know that detail. No. Oops, mm. I, I missed that when I was learning because we didn't have the resources uh, on the mats. Like you think when you're on the mats, how many black belts are on the mats now? Or so like in more. the kids' classes, it's not, it's not a white belt running the kids' classes. It's like purple belt or higher yeah. at most gyms. Sure. At my program, we have... Like we are, most of the time we have three black belts on the mats. You know, like, I even I even find everybody when you're starting, they look at the a black belt as the icon. You know everything. You don't know everything. There's seldom a, a, a class, a lesson I go to that I don't pick up something, whether I'm teaching it yeah. or watching somebody else, because I'm so I'm looking now, right? I'm looking at it different, and now I'm going. I never saw that before, and I, yeah. hey, this is a yeah. good class. I learned something. Yeah. What happens, especially with colored belts in jujitsu, is they, um, I feel like at Blue Belt and Up, already have like a move that they are almost at the level of a black belt in that move because they've done it over 10,000 yeah. times. Because like it, it's working on everyone. And then if you can let your ego go, even as a higher belt, and ask that person, how are you doing that? Yeah. It can benefit you. No, I, I absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. My, like I mentioned my uh, old student, David Elliott, like when he was an orange belt, his triangle was at a black belt level. Like it was just that's what he was winning world titles with just triangle from close guard and it was it was so good it had gotten to the point where andrew and myself as his instructors didn't really understand how he was getting it as often as he did like when we were in new york for that abu dhabi qualifier we were sitting in like the the bullpen waiting to go into the finals and matt sarah turned to me and he's like there's no way your boy is going to triangle my guy in the final and i'm like I wanted to fire back, but it's Matt Sarah, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> I wanted to be like, he's going to, though. And he did. And then when I went over to shake Sarah's hand after the match, he was just like, he's really good at triangles. That's and sweet. And it was, it, was, it was like that validation. It's like, I wanted to take full credit and be like, yeah, I taught him. It's like, but David learned it from me. But then, like you said, 10,000 reps, 10,000. Like he just had a system that was so far beyond like his belt level, but for that series of techniques. Uh, and that, that moment's way more badass when you didn't even need to say anything. Mm -hmm. And then Matt Sarah goes, okay, yeah, you he, got When me. he nodded at me, <laughs> he was like, I wanted to say something, but then he gave me the nod first and then and said something. I was like, good, because I don't, I don't want to make him mad. <laughs> no, that's probably not a good guy to get angry. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, when you start getting into teaching people jujitsu you get better at it but i feel like like you have such an advantage kurt as a teacher in my opinion because i'm sure through the years of getting better at uh showing someone a concept and getting them to understand it yep. it, it must have paid dividends in what you're doing now over at uh, vimy ridge and uh where else is Donin. the Donin Donin elementary Donin. yeah which is where the program started perfect uh and then it just it grew to the point where the kids when they were leaving grade six wanted to continue with jujitsu. So then we, Vimy Ridge is kind of like the feeder school where the kids leave Donnan. So I started at Donnan in, oh, what was it? 2007, and I was teaching in the hockey program. Mm. And then I started doing privates with my uh, principal's daughter after school, and she was in grade five. Uh, and she just, former gymnast, instantly was amazing at jujitsu. So my principal was like, well, maybe we should start a program. 
and it was like don't say that unless you mean it mm. and he was like no i think we should my daughter kira loves it i think other kids would benefit from it as well and of course it, that's the case uh so yeah started at donnan and now we're at uh, both campuses and that's you just answered what i was thinking is how it all started and i just remember when I would start mentioning this at a younger age, and there was a lot of pushback, as I mentioned earlier, um, from just martial art instructors that would just feel like, ah, I don't want to waste my time, or I've tried, and they it was a hard no. Yep. And, you know, why do you think that is, first of all, and, and, and how were you able to, through time, get a principal to be on board with this idea, especially nowadays when we all know that some kids can abuse Yep. The, the the power of what jujitsu and martial arts can offer but at the same time um can also it, it can change their life so yep. how did you go about it you know and, and we just got the live going for people to be aware that in my opinion you're the you're the goat of bringing jujitsu man to, to, to school let's it's go crazy. Well, i mean there's what there's one other guy in the world we've got to give him credit to and that's uh uh, I don't. I, I'll mess up his name if I say it. But the other program that runs in schools is United Arab Emirates, uh, which is kind of neat that we're the only other program that runs in the world. A school curriculum that needs yeah. to change. It needs to be everywhere. Oh yeah, I agree. So mm-hmm. yeah, we started. So when like when my principal Henry Madsen like said like let's get the program going, this was probably in November. Uh, so we had until the following year to try to get basically permission from Edmonton Public. Uh, which started out to be a problem because basically we're we're suggesting we should be teaching fighting in school, and that's that was the roadblock. It was you know we would talk to the Edmonton Public Brass and they'd be like, "Who I don't know about fighting in schools like that's that's not going to fly." And the nice thing with jujitsu is being kind of like the martial art that was proven to be the best for self defense. Like the Gracies did a really good job of showing that. Uh, and then on top of that, there's the whole self-defense piece of it. And then, on, and then to build upon that, we just got into bully prevention. So when you start using education buzzwords like self-defense, bully prevention, uh, self-confidence, self-esteem building, now people started to listen to us. And then once they started listening, we had the ability to show them what jujitsu was. Uh, I remember the very last meeting we had, we had the director of of phys ed for Edmonton Public. We had the superintendent for Edmonton Public. They came to Donnan and Mike Yaklik and I did like a 20 minute jujitsu demonstration. First thing they said when we were done is when do you guys punch and kick each other? Mm. And we were like, there is none in jujitsu. The only time there's punching and kicking is if somebody attacks us and then we just clinch, take them to the ground and hold them there. And they're like, oh, so it's like wrestling. And we're like, you could say that. Uh, but with some of the submissions that we showed you. And then they were like, well, there's wrestling in a whole bunch of schools, so you guys can go ahead. And that, was, and that was it. That was the end. That was, uh, that was the end. We were constantly running up against people who thought that jiu-jitsu was the UFC. And with, and that was right around the same year that like, the first Tough was on, the first Ultimate Fighter, mm-hmm. kind of at the same time. So, like, tattooed guys, big muscles, blood elbows knees on the ground that's what they thought we wanted to bring into schools where it's like no we want to bring in self-defense we want to bring in a martial art that improves self-confidence in students and kids where they'll no longer be bullied because they have self-confidence but they also have so much self-confidence that they won't be bystanders anymore and they'll start to intercede if they see this stuff happening uh and in my this is the 16th year we've run jiu-jitsu in our schools and i haven't had an incident where one of my students has used jiu-jitsu in a playground altercation like no i haven't had to deal with a principal coming to me and being like we've got a problem but that's like an unofficial stat of hey this is working because if 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 a kid hasn't had the chance to use jiu-jitsu i'm going to argue that then there isn't much altercations happening now to begin with well, not necessarily the altercations. What the, I think the reason is is that that self confidence piece, and I, I know that you can speak to it, and probably you too. You think of like when we were kids, like we got in fights, but I haven't been in a like a fight outside of a dojo since I started jujitsu because it's kind of like 
I fight all the time. I don't want to <laughs> fight you. <laughs> if I can interrupt, I think people, I never started martial arts till much later in life. I boxed a little bit when I was young, right? But I believe people that train to fight and know how to fight, they don't fight. They'll defend themselves if it comes to them and they can handle that very well. But they're not, they're not out there looking for it. Like when I was young, you know, it was a different world, right? And people were fighting and yep. on the streets and the bars. You know, it wasn't crazy, but it was there and it was it was very common. But now when I, you know, in the martial arts world, I rarely, rarely see a student of ours or somebody I know in an altercation. Be because they're taught to recognize the situation, the first method of self-defense is to leave, right? Well, also too, like when with the students, with their self-confidence, you can't, you can't de-escalate a situation verbally if you don't have the confidence to back up an escalation, saying? right? Because not everybody you can, you can't talk everybody down. But the fact that the students can, like on the playground, can get into an altercation and not be intimidated, uh, or can see something happening and just be like, "Hey, guys, we don't do that here." Let's use our words yeah, first. Yeah, like we use our right. words, you know, and then. Because they've got that self-confidence piece, if they do walk away and the kid continues to chirp or beak, it doesn't bother them because mm -hmm. they've got that confidence of what they could do. They know. Uh, that's that's and everything. It, and right it's there. such a huge piece. That's that's everything. Yeah. It is because they know if dude comes for it, it's going to happen. But I'm not going to make it happen. You have to start it. Even in the way like you see a kid start carrying themselves when they start training martial arts. I'm seeing this before my eyes with like a student of mine in um, my, my classes. He's eight years old, reminds me so much of me as a kid. And that's kind of like the scary thing when you start recognizing that, <laughs> when you start telling these kids things, you're like, oh my goodness, whether this makes sense to them uh, now they're gonna get older and they're gonna start like dissecting these moments the same way I do with conversations I've had with my coaches and anyway he carries himself very like he go he, you could tell he just goes about life and is 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 careful to not step on anyone's toes um, closes his eyes in a moment if he gets nervous right and and a lot of this is susceptible to, to bullying mm -hmm. and it was sad to hear he's just a fantastic example of someone that should start training martial arts to increase that confidence. Yeah. And even in the past like month since he started, the way he's walking in the room, the way he's talking to other kids, yeah. Yeah. Um, me even just asking and checking in, hey, how are things going at school? And he's like, oh, nothing. Like no nothing's happening anymore. And I, I just asked him like, what do you think's changed? He's like, I think that like, he's like, just through me doing this now, he's like, I just, I, I feel, he's like, I feel less scared. And he's like, I think that's why people don't want to, yep. like, they don't care anymore. But it's, when I look at it, he it was just an easy target before. Yep. And and he was always scared. And then, as we know, kids, they feed off that. Body language. Yep. They see the body language and they, f they feed on the weak one in the room because a lot of these bully kids, they don't have the confidence. And I, and I, you know, to me, everybody, and I agree, you want to teach the kids that don't have the confidence, but I also see a part of me that I like to bring in some more of the bullies and teach them the right way. It's not okay to bully. Yep. And I mean, I've seen it at our gym. We've all seen it. Some bully comes in and he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. And then all of a sudden he isn't because he's a good athlete at something else. And he tries to put that on, onto somebody in the sport. And there's always a couple of guys in the gym who are more than capable of managing that plus, right? And and it puts that guy in the check right yep. away. And Absolutely. What, what just happened to me? And and, and and he's put in the check, but he's not harmed. Mm. Right? Yeah. Do you notice that, Hal? When, like, I don't know, do you do much no gi? <laughs> I do a little bit of no gi. But or maybe I should ask him this I'm way. Pretty heavy. You don't want to see me in a rash guard. Like when you were, like, okay, someone asked this in this way. <laughs> I, I don't I'd still disagree. I find that it's still very scary to go up against you, gi or no gi. But like you know when you kind of judge someone, like you might have like a white belt uh, or or any belt to look at you in your blue belt days or purple belt days, and they'll be like, oh, you know what? I'm going up against an older gentleman, this should be easy. And then they get their ass handed to them. Did you ever experience those kind of moments? Oh, absolutely, lots. I still experience it. Yeah. I, I think now as a black belt, I mean. It, Maybe it's getting a little softer because as a, as I'm aging, but when you walk in a room as a brown belt in a different gym, 
You're a target. Oh God, yeah. You don't see all, all the eyes looking at you for sure, right? Yeah. It's different, man. It's yeah. it's. You know what happened to me, and I'll, I'll admit this is, I started to recognize just habits I needed to change, even around showing up on time. That oh. what like my my coach Pedro, shout out to him from Frontline. He instilled in me, and he's like, as soon as I got it. I'd show up as I normally do 10, 15 minutes late, which is not okay. Like, you shouldn't be doing that at any belt. Like, have have respect for your gym. Have respect for your time. I clearly didn't. And when I got my brown belt, it was like two times I came late. He, he, he told me, he's like, come here. He's like, I, you need to start coming on time. And he's like, if not, like, people look at you as an example now. Yep. You're a leader. So whatever, it's known as a purple belt. You show up whatever time you hey, want. As long as you right? warm up, you're good. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a purple belt thing, it right? So, so I, I was a copy of that. But he's like, as a brown belt now, you, no. you're looked at as an example. So yep. he's like, don't disappoint me in, 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 in me honoring this to you. Yep. No, because, and, because eventually, you know, you're, you're going to get to the black belt. And you're, you're going to represent whoever gives you that black belt. Yep. You're gonna res- in a res- you have to respect that. You have, you have to be a leader. In, in everything you do in, in your everyday life, uh, the more people are going to recognize you and they're going to always be watching. Like I, 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 you know, because of some of the things I've accomplished, I, my wife and I can't really go very many places. Oh, somebody knows you. So, so I, you know, I have to, I can't be an idiot. I have to be on my toes. <laughs> Let's put me in check. I can't be that old fool, right? So, well, and, yeah. that, and, that, and that increases as soon as you have students. Oh, yeah. Right? Because, because now... Now, you, like, you're right at the front and everybody is following you. So, yeah. like, you have to be... Kids are watching. You have Kids. to be yeah. po- constantly pushing to just be, you know, a good role model. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you want you want the kids that are following you to want to be like you. Mm. But not necessarily as a jiu-jitsu athlete, more like as a person, like a person right? right? So then that comes down to our relationship building and having a club with a great atmosphere and a culture and, and ensuring that that continues to, like... Uh, to roll because you know jiu-jitsu can produce good athletes world champion fighters best self-defense you know yep. whatever but at the end of the day it's about building good humans if you really dig deep and and, and look back and kano and all and right it's about making the world a better place and and you know that, that's why i say fighters don't fight because if, if you if you you know like 35 or 40 years ago, I, I'd have walked around, you know, a big, strong, young guy. I wouldn't have been afraid of anything, right? But now, when I know some little peanut who's 130, 40 pounds, I don't know, that guy could be a lethal weapon because he might train martial arts because mm. I train martial arts and I know what happens on the dojo. Yeah. That keeps me in check. Yeah, I wish know. people could understand that, but they don't, right? I didn't understand that 35 years ago. There's no way. Being more aware of that, that reminds me of, like, yesterday's UFC event Bilal remember the name Muhammad which funny enough what helped me remember his name is his nickname I was like I was like I yeah. said remember the name and I'm like I'm gonna remember that name and I haven't watched much of his fights but you look at someone like him and you're like he looks like a guy who can be my barber but like you see him and you're like wait a second he's one of the most dangerous people on earth i think that's i think that's one did. of my favorite things about jiu jitsu there are certain guys like even in edmonton that like now knowing jiu jitsu i'm like how i'm like everybody that i see in the world is a threat because they're probably trained at a higher level than i am so it's like we're good but like you think about some guys that we train with just the way that they look what they wear, you know, how they act. If you ran into them at a bar, you'd be like, and he'd turn around and be like, what are you going to do? But like, well, I'll fight you for sure. And then you would get murdered because well, of the skill set. Yeah. And it's, it's unlike boxing where like boxers have a look, right? Like almost every boxer mm-hmm. like looks like a boxer. Mm-hmm. Like nerdy, jujitsu guys, like, you guy, just right? take a look at like Ryan Hall. I think everybody on the planet would be like, I'd fight Ryan Hall. Until, unless you knew about Ryan Hall, yeah. then you'd be like, no, I want to learn from Ryan Hall. Jiu-Jitsu guys look like the most friendly, non-violent people on earth. And there's something to say about this, hey, is like, when you go on the mats, what other place, honestly, besides church, do you go to a place where everyone's wearing the same clothes, you know, gi or no gi, everyone is from all different walks of life, Everyone gets paid marginally very different paychecks. Yeah. But then there's this one 
specific thing that you all have in common is this love for the sport yep. that brings you together. And I think that's another huge reason why people, adults, continue to do it because of the sense of community. You know, and like how I could talk to someone who's lived a very different life as me, who, let's just be honest, might have very different values, yep. but we get along still. Yep. You know, like that, there's something to say when, about that. When you enter the dojo, the way I look at it, religion, you know, gender equality, bullying, ego, everything, everything stays back. Nothing, you know, matters except jiu-jitsu. And, and really, that's how the world should be, right? People, it, it shouldn't matter what, you know, we're arguing about politics or color, or your religion is better than my religion. But in that dojo, that all comes together. But outside the dojo, in, in the community, the world, politics, oil, money, people are arguing, social media, that's, that's a different world, right? And if that camaraderie that happens in the dojos can grow and build, you know, I, I, th I think it helps make the world better. I, really, I believe that. I see it. I, I, I love it. I agree. It keeps me coming back. I see, you know, both of you have done this in, in the most honest, like, loving way possible with what you both have done with Little Warriors. And, you know, I know a little bit about it. I'm going to get both of you to speak more on it. But uh, Little Warriors helps um, just raise more awareness around those who have been sexually abused. And what both of these gentlemen have done is uh, both of you have orchestrated uh, an event recently that has helped raise over $55,000 and that is an event around jujitsu. It is. And the impact that makes, honestly, from talking about community, from talking about any approach of people feeling like, oh, like, you can't really make money from jujitsu. And both of you have managed to make over 50K for a charity that needs every single penny to do what they do. And I believe there was upwards of over 100 people at the event. There was many children there. And I just want to give you guys the chance to talk about, you know, what that event felt like and what difference it made. A little bit more about Little Warriors and how you guys managed to help them out and just hear more about that experience. It's unreal. So I can start. The, the Little Warriors Be Brave Ranch is a, is a therapy program, and, it, and it's... Uh, east of our city and it's a spot for children who are sexually abused and they go there and they go through a therapy program so I, I've, I've been there a few times to help hang out with the kids teach them self-defense and um, for me I uh, my sister was abused so it, it you know it hits home right it, I've seen the impact on her my family myself so a few years ago for me I had a, I don't know I woke up one night and I wonder if I could do this and then I did my little 60 times 60 thing and that was fun, tiring, but we raised a lot of money, right? And that was 60 rounds of jujitsu when you turned 60, right? Yeah, That's 61 so cool. minute yeah, rounds. I, I think I was round 28. Yeah, you were that there. Was you so, it was so good. It was came, awesome. Right? Yeah. But you weren't a brown belt, so you were late. Yeah. yeah exactly. Missed, missed right. the first 28 minutes. Yeah, but was K yeah. KB was there. But, yeah. but really, uh, you know, as, as for me, as rewarding it was to, to help... help um, the Be Brave Ranch Kids, and that program was very rewarding that I could connect all the gyms and all, all the community. Like that was like, wow, look at look yep. at this. I had no idea I could do that. I just woke up one day and went, I wonder if I could do this. Shark Tank thing, right? And and I, I originally thought maybe we could raise a thousand bucks in our own gym, right, if I do this. And then it just yep, took big, off and big. it grew, right? And then, um, you know, fast forward to, to these days, Kurt, who, who was there was kind enough through some of the other guys in our gym to bring me to his open mat at, at Donnan. Yep. And, and we're just like this chatting one day and it's just kind of what if. Yep. And, I, and I, I called a buddy and he said, you know, I don't know if I can do any uh, big donations because of tax implications. I said, Paul, I'll meet, I'll meet you for lunch and we'll talk. He said, I'll buy you a, a PS5. So we got a prize, right? And then we started rolling, and then yep. Kurt got some stuff, and I got some more stuff, and then we connected the gyms, right? And and we had eight gyms, eight gyms, over 150 kids, 150 kids on the mats, and then we, yeah, and we it was awesome because with eight gyms, what do we what do we count? 13, 14 black belts on the mat, mm -hmm. uh, and then we had the black belts just rotate. The kids were all in stations based on age, and we did like we did four 15 minute seminars 
and then mm. and then did 45 minutes of rolling you weren't allowed to roll with kids from your own gym and then we just like, like mixed that. everybody up and we explained to them like it's this isn't competition you might have competed against that kid at the last five tournaments but this is where you get to like you get to talk to him during the round if you want like this isn't have fun this is there's no medals this is yeah and this is this is for everybody uh and it was really cool because my program we did uh world grappling day uh tap cancer out which is the the company in the states that like does that so basically it's like you have to roll for 60 minutes and it was on no i think it's november 18th and that's a saturday so i contacted them and said we're gonna do this but we have to do it on friday because my program runs during the week and they're like go to it uh so just through like the website and raising money like my just my two programs we raised 7500 bucks wow for cancer research and then we had a whole bunch of uh a whole bunch of my buddies how came to roll with the kids and we did we did 23 minute rounds and then you know hit the target uh, and the kids liked it so much like literally it was like three four days later they're like well what are we doing later in the year I'm like well, what do you mean they're like well, what are we going to do for another another fundraiser I'm like wow i'm not sure i was gonna set another one up because like that's just you going to your parents and your aunts and uncles and asking for more money i I didn't feel like I wanted to do that. Uh, and then again, yeah, at the end of our open mat, I was like, Hal, the kids want to do another one. But if we're going to do another one, let's make it big. Let's go bigger. Mm -hmm. Like, And I don't want it to just be my program. Like, let's pull, because I have buddies at a whole bunch of different schools. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, I, I'd been, uh, you know, I had taught some sessions at Elite. We did some footlock stuff. So we, now we were connected to another school. And it was like, you know what, let's let's see how many schools would want to participate. So we just we sent out some feelers to the schools that we were closest with. And they were like, yep, we're in, we're in, we're in. We'll bring kids, let us know what to do. So then it just became like an organizational thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need it, work on that. Yeah, that, that <laughs> but I mean, first time for anything. It yeah. was our hacking in the woods round. Well, look, I mean, you see it in the dollars, <laughs> right? It's it's getting better every time you guys put an event together. That, 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 that? is the beauty of people people care yeah. right if you can connect and and obviously little warriors you know that i think the stats are one in three women and one in six men yeah. or boys have been abused and if i want you to think about that the next time you walk in the mall take a look around because it's impacting the world and yeah. if you look at at uh, the long-term impacts of the kids that don't get therapy their their you know mental health drug abuse, alcoholism, prostitution. Well, they're not They're not given a fair they're chance. They're not given a chance to rebuild so them. What happens they to them know. as yep. they get older yeah. and how they well, deal with it, right? Yeah, when something it, like this tackles it. They're wrecked. And, and, and then they get into society and they're what I'm going to call wrecked. And they don't have the support or the therapy programs. And they, they end up, um, they're lost souls. And, and just the financial cost of that as a taxpayer in our government, you know, to manage all that in, in the in the healthcare system and the hospitals. I, I don't know what it is, but I don't, I don't understand why we can't put more money into the roots of it. And I don't understand, I don't manage, I don't run Little Warriors, mm. but I'm, I'm an advocate and I, and I believe it's a, great, it's a great program. It's fantastic. I go out there and sometimes it'll, I'll you know, do a little self-defense thing or hang out with the kids. Man, it's a hoot. But when I leave, there's like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. But to be able to help. Every time. And when they see adults who are strong role models, when perhaps that is something that must be so jaded for them. They don't have you that know? at home or, or they've, yeah. been, they've been abused, right? Yeah. It's and terrible. Then, this, last, this last event we did, I, I just did a little social media thing the other day, uh, and it was hard for me. I, you know, on the mat, there's, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but she comes to me and she starts telling me her story. And she was actually one of the first... Um, People who had therapy at this Be Brave Ranch. Young woman, probably 30 ish, I'm going to say, and she went through the program. Now she's a thriving citizen, practicing jujitsu. I went, oh my God, this is fantastic. It's just like, wow, look at you. And, and, yeah, wow. and if she didn't get that therapy, you know, yeah. who knows? Or where would she be, kind of thing, yeah. right? It's, it's a, it's a, and again, it's a chance for me, at least, through, through my jujitsu training and, 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 uh, you know, networking and knowing people and, and, you know, willing to ask, I guess, or beg for pizzas or prizes mm. and, 
it, it, it's been able to connect uh, me in a way to help give back to the community. And I, and I think uh, it's one of the biggest things you can do in martial arts. Our, Rodrigo's uh, Sensei Miura was up here when I, when I got graded to blue belt, and he was a, a red belt, coral belt in, ju in judo. He came up from Brazil, and, and he was uh, talking about the importance as a martial artist to give back to the community, and it resonated with me. I'll never forget it. It's like, wow, yep. I have to do this and help, right? I, I mean, I love the other aspects, but there's an opportunity here to help. And I think we're doing it. I think we did a great job in the last one. And a lot of credit goes to Kurt. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. Go, think, go ahead. I think that the, the highlight for me, for like what happened at the seminar, is like, yeah, we, we raised, you know, $55,000 and 10 of it came from like one individual, which is amazing. I heard it was like an on the spot, yeah. like I'm going to write a check. Yeah, like, that just, is amazing. Which is, which is unbelievable. And I mean, to, to be a person in, in that position, to be able to donate that kind of money, like unbelievable, like heart of gold. Just the best. The best and the highlight for me, though, is there was $43,000 that was raised by kids. Yeah. And that was like Knock, when you when you when you think about that, like I had a student uh, in my in my junior high program who has a speech impediment. And he came to me the one day and he said that he went door to door one night hour and a half raised three hundred dollars that's awesome and i'm like you you cold doorbell people's houses they don't knock door and, to and, door and door to door with you don't oh. hear that often and like, you hear that at all oh, it was no. like when he yeah again when he when he told me and then he said he was going to go out again the next night because he had so much fun it's like well we're winning this is yeah. this is That's why we're doing what we're doing. And, and, and you know, to, to to have 150 kids on the mat. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, it's okay. That you know, we raise money, but the awareness. Well, you need to be aware that 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 you know, when I was a kid or, or younger, that was a taboo topic. But it's a real life problem, yeah. and people don't want to talk about it. The fact that you're getting kids, um, I think this is the biggest thing that stood out to me was when Kurt mentioned that the kid said when are we doing another one you're exposing them to how damn good it feels to give back to mm -hmm. society yeah. and and you're you're changing their perspective already at such a young age to to know it's not just about me and and i'm i'm such a big believer in like it takes a village you know it yes. takes a village to raise a kid you you can't do anything by yourself and I think the more that we start to hone in on that at a young age, we become more susceptible to asking for help. We become more susceptible to, to, to helping other people and, and, and being willing to do so. Whether it be something as small as, as holding the door for someone or asking them genuinely, how are you doing today? And is, is there anything I could do to help? Is my ears, can I give you my time? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and things like that, that go beyond the surface of just doing it um, surface level and and when you're getting kids now that are involving themselves already in another Saturday to do jujitsu and and now the buy-in is I could win a ps5 and I get to learn from five different black belts from different gyms yeah. without my coach getting mad at me like yeah. like there's it's, the it's there's so like cool. taking out the politics yeah. of jujitsu which let, let's honor that too that's the other thing I was gonna mention I feel like both of you whether you realize it or not are in the process of and I think this is maybe a jiu-jitsu thing or Edmonton thing or whatever you want to call it is the politics that have been associated in the past. I don't think it's much of a thing anymore where someone goes and trains at another gym and then if word got around, the coach is going to get upset. That's dumb. That I think is just bullshit. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad both of you have taken something that anyone would be stupid to say no to because it's part of giving back yeah. to people that are in need and yeah. getting people together to train. I don't think there's very many gyms at Edmonton, if any, that I haven't trained in. There's a couple, yeah. but I just haven't made it there. But most here now are very welcoming. I, you know, years That's ago, changed, though. Oh, it's changed. That's it's definitely changed. changed. But, I, you know, I, I, my wife and I like to travel, right? And I, you know, we're just in Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. I'm training over there. But, you know, I, I'm just yeah. sending a message on, on uh, Instagram or Facebook, and can I borrow a gi or training? I was in Croatia. I train all over the world when we travel, right? And it's fun because the community is very welcoming. Like, you, you know, you go to Hawaii there. I was training a few years ago with uh, Bruno Oswald and his guys. They'll come back Saturday. I said, eh, you know, it's a holiday. I have to do yeah. stuff with my wife. I want to do this and we want to do that. 
Hoyler's going to be here as my sensei. I go, what? I'll be, I'll be there. <laughs> I talk to my wife, right? Don, very yeah. understanding. Yeah, that's great. I'll go do yoga. And wow. You yeah. go do that. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah that's cool. amazing. It's that a serious awesome. community. It's, it's so cool. I love that part of it. Jiu-Jitsu makes the world feel so small. It does. <laughs> it, is small. it does. It, it does. It yeah, can absolutely. Be small, right? Yeah. But I, I I think it's it's important. That was one of the things when we were planning the seminars. Like, let's try to get as many g- gyms involved. Uh, we'll definitely start with the ones that we're closest to, and then hopefully this will go really well and it'll be successful. And then some of the gyms that maybe we're not as close to, or we don't have that same relationship with, seeing the success that we had, maybe they'll reach out to us and say, "Hey, when you do that next year, like make sure like we're we're part of that." Uh, and whether or, not, whether or not that that's schools in Edmonton or maybe like there's a couple of schools in Calgary, they're like, we're going to run the same thing in Calgary on the same day. Mm. Let's do it and make it provincial wide. Like, so, because, uh, you know, big, sorry for interrupting again, but big picture, we're making better humans. Yeah, it always line, goes right? back to that. And if we're bringing them up, you know, those kids are in grade three. Well, yeah, we had kids we, we, we had seven year olds to eighteen year olds at the right. event. Yeah. So, yeah, what are they going to want to do in ten years, right? Yeah. As far as passing on the torch and keeping. Well, and also too, if we show them that, like, it's super cool to roll with kids from other gyms yeah. for fun. Yeah. Like, you don't have to wait until you are a in a tournament to wrestle or compete with somebody from Frontline or Elite or Rashido. Like, it's cool to train with those kids too, because again, then there's that knowledge passing back and forth. Uh, and there's that community and that relationship building, uh, confidence and, building. And everybody has so much, so much to give, and it and it's in a different way, right? Like, what I can teach and what I can give to students is completely different than what you know Justin Sander can give, or what Pedro can give, mm. or what Rodrigo can give, Everyone's right? Approach. Because we all come from different backgrounds, and we all have different personalities. So if you give us access to all of the kids or all of the people in jiu-jitsu then everyone's going to get so much more out of it that's why you know what a plug i want to add in with that is just seminars is i I want people to be more willing to do seminars and who cares how big or small this athlete's name is if they um and again i know it's not about the belts but what i mean by this is if they have a black belt around their waist it shows they've they have years of of practice to offer you but the personality behind that and how they view life that's gonna come to life in that seminar mm-hmm. for you to like even and i'm not even talking about the moves and techniques i'm talking about the q a i'm talking about how they look at training how they look at strategy like there's been even private lessons i've had not just seminars and i'll give a huge shout out to uh matt kwan i don't know if you guys know yeah. him yeah. um he's out in bc definitely if you're in vancouver go see him he runs um on guard bjj i went there when i was in vancouver yeah i had a session with him and you, okay, so Beautiful I don't know, jiu-jitsu. right? Ugh. My private with this guy, and this was cool, would have never expected it. I'm thinking, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to rep out a move a few times, just like any other private, and 80% of it, and it, this could not have been at a better time, was a conversation. And it was about um, three things, posture, structure, and base. And I don't need to nerd out and go into that in too much detail, but he, he gave me an orchestration of... The importance of just keeping your feet or your hands on the ground at all times yeah. in whatever position you're in. And he rolled with me at first, and he noticed that this was one thing this kid needs help on. Yeah. And, it, man, it was awesome. Yeah. You know, And I think just going back to the point of like recognizing the importance of you could learn from anyone and that you know we talked a little bit about that throughout today's episode, that um, it's cool to just pick someone's brain that you've been training with. Yeah, well, and, you know, like we we can all train together and you could all pick up something like our on Sundays after my open mat, the, the sitting on the mats discussion and then like, Oh, I've got to move you. Sh- Whoa, that would work for your body type. I shouldn't show you this cause I'm going to regret it next <laughs> yeah. week, but I'm going to show it to you cause Oh, it fits your style. Uh, I don't use it, but I know it. Uh, that, that conversation is the best part of, of the day. Like, yeah, the rolling is awesome and it's fun, but it's that everybody in the room, whether it's, you know, uh, one of the purple belts that's there who specializes in being upside down, you know, being inverted. And I never play inverted because of my neck. And then he's like, well, have you tried doing it this way? And I was like, no, I've not. Let's drill that a couple of times. Like, oh. and that's, 
that's getting a new technique that I can practice and implement from somebody that, you know, there would be people out there that'd be like, well, he's got nothing to show you. Yeah. It's just purple belt. It's like, yeah, it's not the case, though. Everybody not has the case. Sure, yeah, even a white belt, so man. Cool. Even a white belt. They, they yeah. don't they show you some They figure stuff things. out. Yeah. They figure out one or two things. And then there's, that's their gem. There's so much. More. I'm more scared to roll the white belt than I am a color belt sometimes. Oh. Especially at this point. Because they're going to do things that don't even exist. Yep. Yep. And they'll yep. do it at 100%. Yeah. It's like, Fantastic. why did you Why did you roll that way? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's where your ankle breaks. <laughs> I, I, even when I was a blue belt, I always... Always, I don't know why I went to the highest ranking guy that's available for role. I always did that because I said that's the best knowledge base and that's oh, yeah. where I'm going to learn the most. I've always been like that. Yep. Mm. Now I look at it, I'm going to go to the highest level guy because it's the safest place. I don't want to get hurt. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you just look at it very differently now. I look at it differently. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not a kid, right? I don't want some. Yeah, and that's that's changing yeah, your jujitsu journey, right? I have to do yeah, the same thing. But, like but, I just. You know, you know, I don't want to come into a gym. Like I, I just, tra- I just trained in uh, Phuket in a gym. I don't want to say the name of the gym, but great, great vibe. You know, the the, the guy that owned it was a fifth degree black belt from Rio de Janeiro. I chatted with him for about forty five minutes. We're on the mat with this Russian black belt, MMA guy, intense. Opens the window. If you guys think you're on fucking holidays, get out, right? And he's just like, barking at everybody. I'm in the wrong. Intense. I'm in the wrong class because I'm on holidays. I'm <laughs> I just had a beer. I'm yeah, drunk. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> anyway, you know, after class we're rolling, and there was no really high level guys there. I'm, I'm handling my own a little bit better, and then he didn't like it, so he brought he brought his uh, his little uh, Russian wrestler guy in to maul me a bit, and he swept me and. And then I got on top of him, and it's it's not going good for the wrestler. And he's putting the knees on me now, a like a couple of knee strikes. And I'm going, dude. In, ju- in like a jujitsu setting role? Yeah, so anyway, that's... I just put the crush on him a little bit. Yeah, like, okay, I'll punch you back. No, I didn't punch him, I just... Got you heavy. Know, got real heavy, yeah. and, real, and just crushed him until he didn't like it. And he tapped top it, okay, good. And then again, and, but I didn't get it. I'm on holidays, dude. Relax, it's for fun, right? Yeah. But I train in a lot of gyms all over the world. I've never experienced that. It's funny you say that because I was listening to, I think it was Chu Jitsu podcast, if you guys are familiar with it. And they were talking about how, no, I think it was, sorry, it was Rogan uh, for the reference. Him and someone were talking about how scary it is. For this guy, uh, Rogan had a, he's a rock band artist. He does Jiu Jitsu. And he actually talked about how he's in fear of going to different gyms in part of this reason. I don't know how you guys feel about it, but... I love going to different gyms because mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm going to get. Yep. And, and I'm willing to take that quote-unquote risk. I think what people should do is when they go to a new gym, make it very clear that you don't train there. And then don't try to impress anybody. Like, like go in with that mentality. You know, because I'm sure as you know, you're probably going to have a very different role and approach it whether you're at yeah, your gym or not. Yeah, right? and, and I'm at the age I'm not trying to kill anybody anywhere. Yeah. But, but I'll say one thing. If you're coming to our gym, and our students don't don't introduce themselves to you, I get a problem with it. Mm. So when I go to the, everybody else's gym, anywhere, I make a point of going around talking, hi, I'm Hal, I'm, you know, and I think that's the way to, to, to take that target off the black belt or the brown belt that, you know, I'm here, on, I'm a friendly, yeah. I'm Hal. I'm not here to beat you up, I'm here to have some fun and learn, I'm on holiday. Yeah. And you know, I was in another gym in um, Thailand or Vietnam, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> There's this guy from Ireland who I rolled with, and you know, black belt, good dude. You want to ride home? Sure. There's 500 pounds on a little moped. <laughs> 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 I, I wish I could see that. That would have been awesome. <laughs> it was hilarious. Right and left turns. <laughs> I yeah. just go, like, dude, this is wild. <laughs> oh man, I love but, that man. But you know, I, I, wherever I've trained, I've, I've, I, I've always somebody's always drove me home. And I love that. I love it. Yeah. Here, I'll give you a drive home. I'll drive The home. trust. I, I trained in, uh, what's it called in uh, Vegas? Um, Sim Golems at uh, Cobra Kai. And mm. I'm sitting there waiting for a cab. And the, and the guy at the desk, he's there. Don't, cab, bugger off. Forget it. Come on, I'll drive nice. you home. There's a plate. Then, there's a gym called Cobra, Cobra Kai, Kai there? Sim Golems. Yeah. It. And he, yeah. the really? thing I know, <laughs> it's this guy's dad, right? He's my age. And and Sim Go is a black belt, high level guy, and and now Dad's driving me home. Come on, let's go into Mayweather's gym and check it out. And I said, Yeah, I know those guys. So we're in there walking around, check it out. Let's go for a pint of beer. Then he drives me home. That's awesome. cool, man. Love that. 
That's that. It, it's all over the place. Hospitality at its finest, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. I think that's what's really important. Um, not to relate it to corporate structures, but like just that top-down mentality of you as the leader, you as the gym owner, you as the the person who's starting to get the traction of building your gym and and successfully putting food on the table from it. You need to make it um, as family friendly as possible because once you get bigger. Once you're beyond that 20 plus people in your class, let's face it, you may not have time to be the one to introduce yourself to the new student. But back to Hal's point, somebody's going to have to do that for you. Everybody and, should. And that's based off of what you said. In, and every Yeah, I agree. Because you know what? So I, I think one of the biggest reasons why people don't continue is the intimidation factor of a gym. And I hope we're starting to like be smart enough to be aware that if you want to be a successful gym owner or run a dojo, you you have to like have people introduce themselves. But you know, Kenny, if if you talk at it in that perspective, it's a service. I don't own a gym, but it's a service. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're running a gym, and you have to treat the, the the students, kids, adults, parents, with respect, kindness, because you're providing them a service. Mm. Those kids could be off playing hockey. But they choose to go there for a reason, and and you have to have a good environment, a friendly environment, and you know the kids should learn learn to be better people, but at the same time they're learning martial art, and and the the way Steve runs Elite and Rodrigo in uh, Spruce Grove is fantastic. You watch Rodrigo; I don't care how many people there, he'll see that new white belt and go talk to him. And that's important. I love that. He he'll still make the time. That's the difference. Because yeah, you right? recognize him. That's the hardest step. For anybody starting the journey is that first step on the mat. It's terrifying. Yeah. Well, and it's relationship building, right? Like a, in, in academics, like kids don't work hard for marks. They work hard for their teachers, right? Like there are those self-motivated kids that are like in grade five and they're like, oh, I'm going to be a heart surgeon. And they're already on that, like dialed in track. But in my experience, if I had a good relationship with a kid and they were more worried about being like me being disappointed in them, that's where you can get the work out of them. That's where you can get that, like that push, even though they don't want to do math that afternoon. Like, I need you to get this done. And then they look at you and you look at them and they're like, because you're asking, I'll do it. And it's the same thing in, in jujitsu for the gym owners. As soon as they're, as soon as I think that I don't have a relationship with that gym owner anymore, or like he doesn't value me as a person, I'm going to go find a new gym. Mm -hmm. And I think people should do that if, if that relationship isn't there. Uh, it's so true and uh, I think once you start becoming aware that a relationship should be there in terms of talking about your growth and, and your progression and if that's not there and you realize that that doesn't need to be the standard right it's almost like you're settling for less yeah in, in, in yeah. your jujitsu growth you don't, right? you don't just go out for average pizza yeah you gotta especially in Edmonton man there's some good pizza joints oh, that's right that's right? right you go for the best and if you're not getting it you don't keep going back yeah. right as, as you get older it's about quality, not quantity. Yeah. yeah. Have a good beer, a good pizza. It's got to be a good thing. 100%, man. But you know what? You talk about quality. I'm going to jump on to my sensei, Rodrigo. He promoted me. Like, literally this morning, I messaged him. Like, everybody in Drayton Valley is evacuated. They got no gym. So sad. What's it's terrible now? with the fires, right? And, and I said, why don't... He goes, yeah, no problem. So I messaged Brad, who owns that gym, if you guys have time come up and train Rodrigo said no problem that's awesome Rodrigo said yeah I got a I got an RV in the back if somebody needs shelter we'll give it to them to wow. be a solid yeah. person and that's our, a leader that's how a leader should should push that down Steve Bartley's the same way right happens without question and when right? people look at leadership like they see everybody on a on a like a triangle on the top of the the pyramid the leader needs to be the guy in the bottom of the pyramid supporting the group right and, and people don't have, they don't see it that way. But that's that's a, a, a visual that I have. When I, when I think about trying to help people and, and, you know, I want to lift people up. I don't want to be a guy on the top of the pyramid. And there's something to speak about that because a good leader um, isn't going to be the one that always tells you what you want to hear, right? And I, I noticed that in, uh, in Pedro from Frontline, even in Rodrigo. Rodrigo was my first coach. Mm -hmm. And these are people that just are going to tell you the honest truth. Whether you ask them or not, they're going to share with you. And I think they notice it in, in your, the, your patterns of your behavior, 
of, of how you're showing up to class. Oh, they're noticing you're competing often. They could just tell through your actions how much you really care. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to give you the advice accordingly. And I think what's cool about jujitsu is that can change sometimes. I'm not going to give you as a hobbyist the same advice I'm going to give someone that wants to be a world champion. And now the, the, the way you train is going to need to be different. The way you, you show up is going to need to be different. But like, as long as, back to um, Kurt's point, the relationship's there, then on both ends are aware of what needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. right? I, I've experienced that. I've had those moments where like, I needed to share my goals to my coach. And then I noticed just how different his approach was back mm -hmm. to me, right? but in a good way. Because mm -hmm. he was able to adjust that. Mm -hmm. And I find that, to be very honest, now to kind of play it on the other side, I feel like it's important for students to also not wait to be asked and like not expect that if something's changed for you for your coach to just read your mind yep. right maybe in the same light as a teacher where like you might think someone's mindset is one way but then all of a sudden once they tell you you start to really understand what's going on yep. and you tailor the advice and approach accordingly well and that's the i had a conversation with one of my grade nine students on on friday i got a message from her mom just being like she's feeling bored you know mm were a little bit like things aren't going well and That's all it good. was all it was was <laughs> yeah. it was a discussion though about what the boredom actually was and all all it is is like you're at that you're at that blue belt plateau where like you kind of everything's starting to be similar you've seen so much jujitsu by now that you're not seeing new technique all the time it's repping it out you're losing to people that you don't think you should be losing to. You're not beating people that you think you should be beating. Uh, so it's kind of like, where's your head at? And then just through, like it was a 15 minute conversation. It was, there was an understanding. Now I understood where she was coming from. And then it was just being able to express to her like mm -hmm. this, you're not bored with jujitsu. You're bored with where you're at in jujitsu. So, you know, getting going, and maybe altering your training a little bit. Like, let's focus more uh, on wrestling this summer, maybe, instead of jujitsu. Like, like, that's going to help you be better at jujitsu, but it's just a little bit different. Uh, and we all have those plateaus in training, whether it's like we get bouts of injuries or, you know, things just aren't going well. Uh, and it's having the ability as a student or as a coach to have that conversation, whether it's hard or not. Like sometimes that's what we need in order to, like in this case, keep somebody in jujitsu. Whereas like someone like you, it's like, well, how do I take my game to the next level? And well, mm. as a coach, it's like, well, I'm going to train you differently then. If you're ready for it, we'll do it. Uh, You'll feel the change. You'll yeah. be excited about yeah, it. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Uh, whereas, like, you know, we had, have other kids in the program, like I said, that will never, ever compete. They're in it for a different reason. And that's okay. And too, right? their conversations with me are significantly different than the kid that goes in every tournament and it has to be mm -hmm. but that's why jujitsu is good uh for everybody and do you feel like kurt on that point in the structure of classes is it so beneficial to have competitors and hobbyists in the same room together um training it, it depends on the environment yeah. right so at, at my program because we've got kids that are part of my program, but they also train at other schools uh, at nighttime, my focus is skill development, right? So our training, like when we do roll, I can put my uber competitor with like the girl who's never going to compete uh, for, you know, reasons that I'm aware of. And during that role, it's, the competitor's responsibility to ensure that this is a good role for her, right? So he can still sweep her, get to submissions, help her escape, and then next role when he's with another competitor, they can dial it up to a thousand and go. Uh, it's just getting the kids to understand, you know, like when you when you roll with your competitor buddies, go super hard. If you're not getting enough out of them, ask the coaches to roll. We'll roll with you hard. But when you roll with certain other kids, whether it's somebody who it's their first year in the program and they are coming from being bullied for three years in another school, we don't put it on those kids. And it's really nice to have all of the kids in the room together because then we're all like improving at the same rate, but we're improving in different areas, right? 
I, I'm really glad you have those conversations with them because for me, I, <laughs> as you were saying that, man, I, uh, I was always known, and I actually would get upset about this, but when I got older, I realized I should have gotten upset. But I'd be upset growing up that not everyone would want to roll with me. And people would be like, you roll too hard. So two things there. Number one, I should just, I need to learn how to adjust my roles <laughs> depending on who I'm with. And number two, yeah, like at the end of the day, just recognize that the way you roll is going to be catered and suited well with another person yep. that has the same goals as you. Yep. But then if you can adjust and then you can know that you're like that, then you, you, you don't have to get upset about it. Yep. Right? You know, for, for me, when you talk like that, I've, I've ruled with, you know, some of the highest black belt cyborg and, but he knows how to adjust his game for me. And, and a number of other high levels, you know, in Brazil, the Guerras and we're in their gyms and, but they, Jacques Array, right? Yep. He's not kicking the hell out of me. He's letting me do my thing. And that's what's so cool about it. That, yeah. That's why I'm still yep. a big advocate of going for that high level guy because <laughs> mm. they treat you right. And, and, and there's, the, they're not that young spastic white belt athletic guy. That's going to move the wrong way and yep. separate your shoulder. Right? So true. Man, I, I appreciate this conversation so much, guys. I want to be respectful. I know uh, you guys have homes and, and, and wives to go home to. <laughs> but, um, you know, that being said, I just feel like today we made such an impact on just, you know, the importance of training jujitsu, the community aspect of, of, of what's involved with it and, and what both of you are doing. And uh, I'd like to take the time to see, you know, how can people get a role with you? How can people connect with both of you guys uh, to just continue to learn more about what you both are doing and uh, to keep following the journey? Well, you can find me at Elite uh, Southside Edmonton, Elite Martial Arts. I'm at Rodrigo's and Elite Spruce Grove, or, you know, find me on Instagram or, or Facebook. And yeah, I'm, I'm old, but I'll roll you. Yeah, and, uh, love it. <laughs> Love it. I'll roll with you. Roll you. There's a difference. Yeah, there. Yeah, there is a difference. He meant to word it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm closer to dying than most of you. I'm not afraid yeah. of it. Yeah, that's I right. love it, man. Thank that's you, so Hal. Good. That's so good. And how about for you there, Kurt? Uh, yeah, so it, basically, any anybody who's interested in like having their child do jujitsu during school hours, uh, like we had talked, there, it's not a lot of opportunity for it. We, uh, we're pushing, obviously, to get more uh, out there. Uh, Donnan Elementary School in Edmonton, that's for grades three to six, and then Vimy Ridge Academy, uh, which is grades seven to twelve, uh, and we take you don't need any experience. So like, I get a lot of emails being like, "Wow, can somebody join in grade 11? And it's like, "Yeah, absolutely, you can join in grade eleven. Because that's a great time to start jujitsu. Any year is a great time mm. to start jujitsu or any totally. day. So, uh, and then uh, I'm kind of all over the place in my rolling. I train at like at my school at my dojo after hours and on weekends and then i'll be at a lead or method jiu-jitsu or ludus or whatever so cool. yeah just uh hit me up on on instagram uh, and, and we can uh we can definitely plan some stuff that'd be awesome man we'll make sure we add that into our uh you know content and info so people can connect yeah. and uh is is there some sort of exclusivity kurt to to the two schools or are there plans to grow this um within edmonton that you want to have uh you know your your name in and uh what does that look like especially for those like i know that takes people that takes yep. interest and, 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 and so. that's the thing uh, to grow to grow the program basically means i just need numbers right so you know when the first year we did the program we had 18 kids now next year i think we're looking at having we'll have 65 at the two that Love combined it. at the two schools but the the bigger the program gets so every time we add 18 students we need another instructor or another teacher that can teach jiu-jitsu mm. and as that continues to grow that just means that the program gets bigger uh, the bigger the program gets the more validity that it has and then it's easier for me when people call me to say like well i'd like to do jiu-jitsu as a high school option and we've done this before we've got i helped a guy in victoria get it going there's a guy in toronto that's got it going uh, and i helped him do that and then it's just if my numbers go from 65 this year to 95 next year and then we're at 200 in the schools then when we do go to calgary public and say you should have jujitsu in your school i've got a guy and this is how you structure like the school for a sports alternative program mm -hmm. then it can start to build 
I love that, man. That's that's the domino effect right yeah. there, right? I um I want to say this even you know on air and share it with you. Like I'd love to be involved in one way, shape, or form. Yep. And man, I'll say this on air because I believe it. I feel like what you're doing is you are beginning the the route of what jujitsu is going to do for people with what wrestling did for public schools. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking scholarships, university opportunities, yep. you know, like free ride abilities for people to see at that young of an age that if they go all into jujitsu they're going to be able to to have free education and they're going to be able to do something incredible with their lives Mm -hmm. so you know keep going man i I, I appreciate everything you're doing it was a no-brainer to have you on as well as hal and uh i just see so much potential out of this and i think it's so cool that you know you're the first person to be willing to to be patient enough to, to take those steps yeah. because I think what you're doing, it's very easy for anyone to just see one hurdle, which I'm sure we could have a whole other podcast on the hurdles you've dealt <laughs> yeah. with and then go, ah, you know what? It's not worth it. I could still just train jujitsu at my dojo. Screw it. Yeah. But like what you're doing takes clearly a lot of passion and, and, and willingness to know that it's so beneficial for kids. So good on you, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Good stuff, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode on Second Floor Podcast. And, you know, like we always say, we bring on, you know, tips on how to survive and thrive and just keep the good vibes going. And hopefully you felt that um, with these two incredible gentlemen with us today. So you know where to find them. And we'll see you on the mats. Cheers. There it is.